Welcome to the Prepared Environmental Change webinar series hosted by Indiana University Environmental Resilience Institute. We would like to acknowledge and to honor the Miyak Miyaki, Lenape, Bodawadnik, and Sa Wunwa people as past, present, and future caretakers of the land on which Indiana University Bloomington is located. These ancestral indigenous homelands and resources are the home, current home of the Environmental Resilience Institute. We encourage everyone to engage with contemporary communities to learn the histories of this land, to look at who has and does not have access to its resources, and to examine your own place, abilities, and obligations within this process of reparative work. Our webinar today will focus on habitat connectivity and sustainable land use practices for the reinforcement of your community's natural resilience. All webinar attendees are muted. Please enter your questions in the chat function, which you can access by hovering your mouse over the Zoom window. After you hear from our presenters today, we will share a short feedback survey through a Zoom poll as we begin the discussion portion of the webinar. We are recording today's webinar, and I'll share a link to that recording along with follow-up resources with all registrants early next week so that you can share what you've learned with your colleagues or revisit the information later. And now I'm pleased to introduce today's moderator, Matt Flaherty, our Implementation Manager at ERI. Thanks so much, Lacey, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, connecting and preserving habitats can protect endangered and at-risk plant and animal species, increase carbon storage, manage flooding, improve ecosystem functionality, and more. All critical benefits amid a changing climate. Sustainable land management practices that promote connectivity can also provide opportunities for building social connections and partnerships among landowners, farmers, local organizations, conservation nonprofits, and government to increase community resilience. Today, we'll hear about general strategies and considerations on this topic, as well as new opportunities presented by the recently announced Southern Indiana Sentinel Landscape designation. This webinar series is coordinated by IU's Environmental Resilience Institute. And in addition to our webinar series, ERI uh, has a number of other resources available to local governments and the general public. Uh, we'd like to highlight one of those at the beginning of these webinars. And today I wanted to highlight the Environmental Resilience Institute Toolkit, or ERIT, as we call it. Uh, ERIT is an interactive tool that provides tailored information, tools, case studies, funding opportunities, and other resources to help communities prepare for climate change impacts. The toolkit includes um, case studies and adaptation strategies that address habitat connectivity specifically, ecosystem protection, and enhancing biodiversity in your area. If you're interested in exploring these topics in the toolkit after today's presentation, uh, Lacey is going to share a link to that in the chat now. So thank you again, everyone, for, for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, on this next slide, we've listed a few of today's registrants from local governments and other organizations uh, around the state and Midwest uh, to give you a sense of, of who's tuning in today. We'd also like to thank Accelerate Indiana Municipalities, the Association of Indiana Counties, Health by Design, and the Indiana Public Health Association for their continued support of the webinar series. I'll also note that uh, this month's webinar brings to a close our 2021-2022 Prepared for Environmental Change webinar series. Uh, so so much, thanks so much to, to folks who've attended throughout the series. We hope you found the presentations helpful. Um, and please watch your emails for a follow-up survey later this summer asking for feedback on future webinar topics, as well as the overall format of the series. And so without further ado, uh, I'd, I'd like to introduce our speakers. We're really excited to have Dr. Vicki Moretzky and Dr. Christian Freitag joining us for today's webinar. Dr. Moretzky is a professor at the Indiana University O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs and the director for its environmental master's programs. And Dr. Christian Freitag is the executive director of the Conservation Law Center and a clinical associate professor at the Indiana University Maurer School of Law. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Vicki. You're muted at the moment, Dr. Moresky. If you... So many basics to think about. Thank you. Thanks, Lacey and Matt. 
And thanks also to the audience who's with us here today. It's, it's good to see such a good representation across the sectors in natural resources and municipalities. Um, and we make sure here that I have control of slides. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and get started. We have miles to go before we sleep. So our first concern here is understanding what habitat is and how it relates to connectivity. Habitat does a lot of things. It has to provide not only the standard food, water, and shelter, but for species that have special needs, it needs to do those. But for connectivity, we're often talking just about movement and migration corridors that are used in the short term. And those may not and often do not provide the full range of habitat needs. Uh, if you're moving through on migration between North America and South America, you're not going to stop and raise young along the way, for example. Habitat, as it's properly used, is specific to a species or a group of species. And for some species, vegetation is an afterthought. So the salamander and the snake that are shown here don't really care much about the plants. The salamander uh, is after little bugs in the soil and needs moisture. The snake is worried about fuzzy nuggets and doesn't much care where those show up. It needs rocks and similar kinds of situations to protect itself for shelter. And because of this specificity, habitat is a different thing from land cover. Not all forests will support wood frogs. We need water for wood frogs and a forest over limestone may not provide it. But we do see the terms being used interchangeably and so it's important in your own minds to be clear about what you mean. Whether you're talking about forests or forest habitat, streams or stream habitat, as you work through all of this. Not only is habitat specific, but habitat quality is specific to the species or group of species of interest. And nevertheless, many of us who are in the conservation and land management fields are pretty comfortable talking about a high quality woods without worrying about whether we're talking about the barred owl, which will also use my backyard, or the salamander that doesn't care about whether or not there are woods there. Some of the characteristics that we're interested in for high quality are typically the lower two of the bullets under the next item that we have appropriate levels of natural disturbances. So fire, if there should be fire, flooding from time to time, if there should be flooding, and low levels of the various habitat degradation problems that we run into, everything from invasive species to poaching. In addition to that, there are some things that help to get us higher biodiversity within a high quality area. So if we have some uppy downiness, if we have topography, that will give us both the moister areas at the bottoms of the slope and the drier areas at the top of the slopes. Different kinds of trees, different amounts of litter on the soil. And if we're in a montane area, going from the bottom to the top of a mountain range will get us a whole lot more variability. And that variability means we've got a better chance of hitting the targets that we need to protect a wider sweep of species. When we try to map habitat quality, we run into problems because often what we're after is less visible. It might be older things. It might be less disturbed things. And it's often easier to poll a group of experts and to get their sense of where high quality and low quality is and then to ask them what they're using as their criteria. We also need to distinguish between just a general high quality woods and something that is, for example, a high quality woods for pileated woodpeckers, which need big trees to nest in. The graphic that I'm showing you here is looking at landscape degradation just in terms of whether it's natural, mostly natural, natural with ag, or no natural which is that pink color that's mostly all over the place. And this will work as a good sort of a first level. And it's much easier to do this with remote information and GIS. But once you've said that there's woods there, 
it won't help you at all. It doesn't help you to distinguish between a woods with heavy recreational presence or too much closeness to an area where poaching is likely to happen. All of that will be invisible by this means. And so understanding how you're going to measure and map quality is something to spend some time on. Habitat occurs in, well, we call them patches, understanding that patches can be of different sizes. I'm showing you four different aerial photographs here, three of them of forest and mixed forest habitat, and one of them uh, in the prairie pothole region. Ponds are patches by nature. You're never going to get a pond that isn't a clear, obvious patch, and that's as it ought to be. The wetlands that are connecting the ponds here, though, in this case, in the North Dakota case, are a more continuous habitat. The forest in the other three are arrayed in different kinds of patch sizes and shapes. So in the Eastern Massachusetts and Southern England case in particular, you can see places where trees are present in stringers, maybe along streams or along roadsides. Perhaps good for local travel by some species, but not certainly habitat for most species and maybe not useful for even for connectivity for a wide variety of species. We can look at the pictures in terms of continuity. We can travel from one edge of the Eastern Mass photo to the other through forests. We can't do it in straight lines, but we can do it pretty easily and we don't have to move into particularly narrow stringers to do it. We can only move in one direction through the Southern Montana photo if we need forest, but we can travel in a lot of directions if we can use grasslands. If we're a pond species, the North Dakota uh, photo is, is showing us that we've got a lot of fairly close connected things with a lot of wetland in between, which sounds like it might be good habitat for connecting. And so depending on what we want to connect and what kinds of habitat we're trying to connect, what determines whether a habitat is fragmented for a given species or group of species will depend on what they can move through. And so we can think a little bit about habitat covers in terms of what's hostile and what isn't. And obviously, the more human connected things are, oops, sorry about that, just saw the mic question. Is this, is this better? Testing one, two, three? I think you're, you're pretty good, yeah, thank you. All right. Um, so the more humans are involved in creating the habitat, often the, the less useful it's going to be. But whereas a coyote can get through an industrial area in good shape, a turtle may have more trouble. And a coyote is not guaranteed to make it through either. Conventional ag fields would be pretty hostile to a frog, but on a rainy night, they might be able to make it across. Making it across 10 fields in a night is probably too far. When we're mapping these things, we often refer to matrix habitats as the things that we don't consider to be habitat. But depending on how we define matrix, they might be things that, we can, that the species of interest can travel through. And if we're being careful with our mapping, we can still acknowledge areas that are being managed specifically for wildlife in one way or another, whether it's an urban wildlife program, or it's a farm bill uh, part of uh, an agricultural area that's being managed in something that's more, we use the word permeable to mean that animals can move through it. The idea of matrix comes to us from geology where the geologists mean it to, to talk about uh, the less valuable rock into which your valuable rocks are embedded. So the white stuff here is matrix in the yellowy greeny stuff is the stuff that's interesting. And for our purposes in terms of mapping, matrix is usually stuff that certainly isn't full service habitat, but it might be more or less permeable depending on how you define it. So moving from a question of habitat to the question of connectivity, Initially, in terms of biodiversity conservation, we started worrying about connectivity 
to make sure that populations weren't being isolated by, for example, urban development or agriculture or road networks, because we learned over time that isolated populations were at greater risk of winking out. They might wink out due to natural problems like droughts, but they might also just become too small to avoid genetic problems, or they might end up with too few breeding females. And what we learned in the process of trying to protect things from, from these kinds of issues is that if you can get good quality corridors that allow several individuals per generation to move back and forth, if there are good productive patches of habitat and then less productive populations, but everyone's connected, you can keep them all going with corridors. Climate change is changing the way that we think about connectivity. It's bringing us a new problem. Under climate change, the very nature of the land is changing. And where populations no longer find an area to be suitable because of climate change, we don't just need to move a handful of individuals per generation. We need to pick the whole blessed thing up and move it across the landscape, if that's possible. The less mobile things, we already know that without help, they may not survive climate change. Some of them are behaviorally constrained. They don't move long distances ordinarily, or they've got very strong links to the land. But even in those species, there's typically one stage in the life cycle, maybe the teenage years, where individuals are willing to move out. And the better that we can provide connectivity, the more numbers of populations, individuals, and species we have a shot at protecting. The very highest level of connectivity is to have full service habitat that can be connected across the landscape. So in this case, it would be the forest in the top picture that is really well connected. Or if that agriculture works for some species in the bottom two areas or the open habitats, then those would work for those species. We need to be able to move more individuals under climate change than we needed to move before climate change. It does still presuppose mobility. So I'm showing you a migratory birds picture uh, in the upper left there. And those are animals that clearly have no trouble finding good habitat as long as it exists. They can pick themselves up and go. Among the ones that don't fly, we still got things like moose as opposed to things like small mammals. And the worst case in most circumstances are the plants and the less mobile species. Some seeds are easily spread by wind. Some of them hit dry on animals and can move very long distances. But some of them like oaks. I mean, really, what's going to pick up an acorn and carry it for many miles? a heavy load for a blue jay, which might carry it for a quarter of a mile, but not much longer than that. And aquatic species also are going to vary in mobility. So the mollusk species that are at risk in many of our streams are pretty darn immobile, but their larvae are actually fairly movable, but only if the rivers in which they live have not been fragmented. So in the middle picture on the bottom, I'm showing you something that connects the waterway, but not for most of the species that live in the water. So this stranded culvert is giving the species in this particular stream a one-way ticket downstream and not allowing them to move back upstream. The dam in the lower right is pretty well blocking anything that's aquatic. And furthermore, it's changing something that had a riverine nature originally into something that acts a lot more like a lake and is friendly to more species that are lake-like than are river-like. So we have connectivity issues in all of our habitats. There's also the question of whether or not people will go out of their way to bar animals from moving. So wolves moving across country have a whole lot more trouble than raccoons in most cases because people find them to be something they don't wish to welcome. And then there are species that are just by their nature at higher risk. So 
Turtles in urban areas are typically frisbee wildlife very quickly and quite dead and flat. Snakes similarly, although snakes come in on both sides because they're often also unwelcome. And so even in urban areas that might otherwise be somewhat permeable, some of the risks will cause them to be completely impermeable to some species or at least much more risky. Habitat generalists are simply more accustomed to more different kinds of things. They'll be able to use more of the landscape and get through more of the landscape. Habitat specialists may still be able to get through a lot of the landscape, but may not be able to use a lot of it long term. And when we say habitat specialists, we want to remember this isn't just things that use only one kind of habitat. It may be things that need a variety of habitats close together. So maybe we have something like ruffed grouse that like small forest openings for drumming areas or grasslands with ephemeral wetlands for some of the frogs that are perfectly happy out of a wetland part of the year but need the wetland for breeding. So there's a variety of things that may dictate what is an obstacle, what is a barrier, and what's just a minor annoyance. Mobility, size, and moisture needs are typically high among those things. So I've listed a, a whole host of things here that for at least some species will be obstacles or entirely barriers to movement. And then as well, we need to worry about what will be a corridor for some species. If you put a culvert under a road, some species will use it regularly. Larger species may not fit, but even smaller species may be reluctant to get into it because for whatever reason, they sense it as dangerous. And let's face it, a culvert doesn't offer an awful lot of protective cover if you're something that can be vulnerable. So understanding what things will pass over or through or around is helpful as well. We're learning more about this uh, as people get more creative with corridors over time. In terms of what people can do to support connectivity and, and plan for it, obviously we need good land cover maps. We need to know where stuff is and we need them up to date. We also need a little bit of information about what climate is going to be like. It's not just in terms of where species are going to go, but what kinds of land cover might or might not work. In southeastern Indiana, a lot of the ag land is getting flooded out these days because of changes in climate. And so we've got a lot more wetland potential, but it's still in ag at present. And understanding what that's going to be in the long term will allow landowners to think more clearly about what's economically feasible and, and where they might get their most return on investment. We want to identify corridors and opportunities for connectivity at larger scales than, than just corridors. Obviously, if we can connect the dots of existing protected lands, we have less to do to connect. Stream corridors give us a lot of opportunities because they're not only about the water corridor, but also about the land corridor around it. And we already protect streams and a bit of habitat around them. It turns out that although most of us think of you know, big downed trees and branches as something that are gonna muck up a stream corridor, for wildlife purposes, they're wonderful habitat. And there's been some work recently out of the Ohio State University demonstrating ways that you can keep coarse woody debris in the stream and actually get it to help water movement rather than hinder it, in addition to offering habitat. Where there's room, beavers can do a lot of good. The wetlands that they create allow water to sink into the ground, slowing down flooding and providing a better water table in case of drought. But there are obviously some places where they're nothing but trouble and understanding the difference is important. We have a bunch of government programs that help to do things that can be corridors and connectivity, but don't necessarily have to be. The Farm Bill programs all have prioritization methods 
that can be modified to emphasize corridors, climate corridors, and connectivity generally, if the people who run those programs believe that those are good reasons for prioritizing properties. Dr. Freitag will be talking about the Sentinel landscape in just a moment, which gives us many good opportunities in this area. We need to understand where the missing links and bottlenecks are and try to get them connected. But we also need to be aware of the fact that there are some things that are false friends. So running something too close to a city may allow too much opportunity for things that we don't think about, cats, dogs, hunters, to move into areas that they might not otherwise move into. We need to be aware of the possibility that a particular uh, settlement pond, for example, around a mine might actually be a hazard for waterfowl if there are contaminants that have not been remediated and that that will serve as an attractive nuisance that will kill things rather than a connectivity point that may support migration. We've got all sorts of zoning and development ordinances, but they have to be used with care. Zoning is a fighting word in some places. And so knowing your audience and what it is that you face as you suggest ways of planning the landscape is important. And restoration, which is one of our biggest tools moving forward, uh, is something that needs to be done with a forward look, understanding what climate, development, and social interests are going to, to do as we move forward. Where we can tie in recreation, where we can build environmental justice, where we can make landscapes more resilient or offer opportunities to attract high value industry, these things will all make it easier to move things into helpful roles in the landscape. This is a map that students that I worked with, oh, about six years ago, created to help understand where wetland habitat opportunities and connectivity opportunities were in southeastern Indiana. The protected areas are in an outlined green, and you can see that those are both the working landscapes of places like Camp Atterbury and Crane, as well as the multiple use landscapes of the Hoosier National Forest and the more wildlife oriented landscapes of the National Wildlife Refuges. The primary corridors here are riverine corridors that are still in reasonably good shape and offer opportunities to connect the dots, as it were. And the background is showing where there is a wetter character of the landscape and more natural cover. So we can do this kind of mapping now to begin to help us to understand what's going on and then take it to experts who can give us information about the highest value habitats in the map. Oops, sorry, moving the wrong way here. There we go. In terms of making connections, we need to distinguish between travel and migration corridors and habitat. If it's only good for travel and migration, then it can't be counted as habitat. And with the climate change concerns, we really do want connected habitat. Where we've got the existing natural vegetation buffers on streams and rivers, we want to grow those if we can, both longitudinally and latitudinally, broader and longer. Where we can combine connectivity work with environmental justice that's adding greenways and protected areas, that's obviously a win-win. We do a lot of things to water that make it less useful to everyone. And so where we can unbury rivers, where we can connect uh, stranded culverts, where we can allow beavers to do those their thing, uh, those are all places where we get multiple wins. Managed lands need to be part of what we're doing. And there's lots of conservation going on on managed lands and many managed land managers who want to encourage wildlife. Being clear about the connectivity interests and the habitat interests here will help everyone to get to places that will make the connectivity and corridor situations better. And in particular, just restoring degraded areas takes areas that are not doing anyone any good and bring them back into things that can be useful. 
In some cases, this may be taking managed lands and making them friendlier, putting pollinator habitat under solar panels, for example, understanding what species you can invite into airports without causing problems for airplanes and bringing them out of the skies, which is bad. Uh, knowing when it's time to suggest that low productivity ag land might do something else, where to protect soils. And in the last case, when we have no other means of protecting habitat, getting a conservation easement on it or buying it, where we have key needs is a good way to proceed. But we need to move cautiously. People tend to feel alienated and disenfranchised if you don't do this transparently, if you don't get buy-in, and if you don't provide some kind of access. So all of these will be important as well moving forward. At this point, we're ready to turn it over to Dr. Freitag and to learn about how the Sentinel Landscape Program can help us with all of this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moretzky. And yeah, Dr. Freitag, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen when you're ready, we're excited to, to hear more from you. I'm getting there. Trust me, I'm getting there. I just need to figure out how to do it. Here we go. All right, everybody can hear me, I'm assuming, and we're just gonna go, go, go. Got the intro, you got the intro. We don't need to work on that. I, I really hate PowerPoints. As a general proposition, I hate PowerPoints because it means you're not listening, you're, you're reading things, but I love maps. So we're gonna spend a lot of time on maps today. Um, but before we get to that, um, I don't want you to focus on this. So I'm just gonna put this up if that's all right. I wanna tell you a bit about, I appreciate uh, I I appreciate Dr. Moretzky, although I have known her long enough to call her Vicky, so I expect I will call her Vicky. Uh, Vicky's also a neighbor of mine, and I've seen that about barred owl sitting on her fence uh, as I've walked past her house. Um, I appreciate the introduction, and I appreciate the work that she done I, she's done on this subject. I would also say that uh, she was a professor of mine for two courses at SPIA during my graduate work, and so whatever dumbness I have or whatever smartness I have, she's, uh, she's to credit or to blame for it, um, or at least in part. So let me tell you, Vicki talked about the general uh, concept of connectivity and habitat connectivity. I'm gonna talk about the specifics of it. And that, I mean, I'm a good person to talk about that, I would say, because I did, some of you know this, I saw Elaine Emmy's here, Bill McCoy's here and others uh, that I've worked with for a long time. Um, I ran a land trust. A land trust is a nonprofit conservation group that works to protect private land. Uh, there's 1,600 of them in the, in the United States. I ran the one in Southern Indiana for 18 years. And so I was really Johnny on the spot. And my team was, we were Johnny on the, Johnny's, we were, we were the point people on, in terms of trying to protect land in Southern Indiana. And we did a good job. We, uh, we saved about 20,000 acres over the course of the last 20 something years. Um, but it became, there was, there was elements that were frustrating and I'll be honest about those because, uh, conservation in the United States has always been done by identifying where that neat thing lives and trying to save that place. So we're going to save that 200 acres or that 2000 acres and save that one thing. And then we're going to find another place that's pretty cool and go save that thing. And never the twain shall meet. That's pretty much how conservation has been done for the last 75 years in the United States. Uh, and our thinking on that is evolving. As a, as a community of conservationists, our thinking on that is becoming more sophisticated thanks to, uh, well, thanks to technology, thanks to negative drivers like climate change. We're, we're catching up, we're maturing as a, as a community, as an industry, I would say, in terms of how we do our conservation work. So I'm here specifically to talk about one of these projects called Sentinel Landscapes. We have the Southern Indiana Sentinel Landscape now. It's only three months old uh, in Southern Indiana. It is 3.5 million acres. Uh, you probably glanced at the map a few minutes ago and noticed it. But I wanna tell you what is Sentinel Landscapes and then I'll tell you why it's important and how we're gonna do the work that we're doing. And it's, it's, a, 
it's an attempt, I will tell you the shorthand is, it's an attempt to address all of the things that Vicky was talking about. We're never going to pull off everything that Vicky was talking about, but we're going to try. Uh, and it's it's the biggest it's the biggest project it's the biggest conservation project ever attempted in the Midwest, and that's saying something. It's the size of Connecticut. It's the it's 1.5 times the size of Yellowstone National Park. Uh, so it's it's got scope and scale, and um, we have high hopes for it. What is the Sentinel Landscape Program, though? Let's start with that. Sentinel Landscapes Program is a federal program that was started in 2013 as a partner uh, as a partnership between. Hopefully, you all can follow the word soup that environmentalists tend to use. I mean, it's it's we're notorious for it, but uh, it's a partnership that was started in 2013 between DOD, USDA, and DOI, which is Defense, Agriculture, and Interior, and they all they all focus on different things, but together. Primarily, it was a defense program when it was started in 2013. The Department of Defense looked around the country and said, our bases face all sorts of encroachment issues. There's all sorts of problems that bases have to deal with. And among them, I mean, the easiest one to point to is resident, residential development on their doorstep. Like if you have a military base where you have to blow things up, which is most military bases, or if you've got to do helicopter flyovers or airplanes, uh, neighbors complain about that kind of stuff. So you don't want to have neighbors complaining. You want to have what they call compatible land uses. And so we have, uh, they developed this program primarily to protect military bases, but then they said, what are the other things that we care about? And what are, what are the, which is to say, what are the other things that the federal government spends money on? And, uh, they said, while we're doing military base protection, let's check off some of these other boxes that we care about. And we'll talk about some of those in a minute. So they, since 2013, there have been seven Sentinel landscapes uh, dedicated. They weren't all dedicated at once in 2013. They've been added over time. But since 2013, they, the government has added seven of them until about three months ago when they added three more. And so there's now 10 Sentinel landscapes around the country. Uh, they range from Fort Benning in Georgia to uh, Eglin Air Force Base in the Panhandle of Florida. Uh, lots, there's several, there's a couple in Texas, there's some in California, um, the places where military bases tend to live, North Carolina, there's the half of North Carolina is a sentinel landscape, and there's one in, in Minnesota, that's the closest one to where we live, is the one in Minnesota. Um, so, to give you another, I, I gave you a sense of geography, to give you another sense of scale, since 2013, those seven landscapes, the government has spent $500 million on conservation programs, half a billion dollars on conservation programs in those seven landscapes around the country in the last nine years. So it's not only large in terms of its geography, but it's large in terms of its uh, financial girth, I, I guess I would say. <clears throat> so let's look at a much more interesting slide than that and see where we're going. The background on this is about two years ago, we got together, those of us who do this for a living and think about this every day, got together uh, partnerships from the from Crane and Atterbury, people from Crane and Atterbury. For those of you, most of you I assume know, but some of you may not know, Crane is the third largest naval base in the entire world. You wouldn't think that Southern Indiana has the third largest naval base in the entire world in terms of its acreage, but it does. And it was founded, uh, Pre, uh, you know, around World War II, when uh, we were worried about getting invaded, and when we were going to make the big bullets that we were going to fire at the bad guys from naval ships, we wanted to make those in a place that that were that you didn't have to worry about a Pearl Harbor situation happening. So they put it in the center of the country uh, to make munitions in World War II. Uh, so that's a naval installation. We've got another naval installation, Lake Glendora Test Facility, that's over near the Illinois border, north of Terre Haute. We've got Camp Atterbury, that's Indiana National Guard, so that's Army. And then we've got a Air National Guard facility that used to be much bigger called Jefferson Proving Grounds for those of us who've been doing this a long time, but now it's most of it's Big Oaks National Wildlife Refuge with a little tiny piece or relatively small piece in the middle of Big Oaks National Wildlife Refuge, which is Air National Guard. So we've got three of the branches of the military represented in Southern Indiana. And we got representatives from those groups, as well as Conservation Law Center, as well as the Nature Conservancy, 
and there's 20 something partners on this thing, but we've developed a core group of people to have a conversation about how we might put in an application for the Sentinel Landscapes program, which they had just opened up after kind of a three year hiatus. And why would we think that Southern Indiana would be able to compete with these big dogs in North Carolina? I mean, Eglin Air Force Base, I mean, that's that's giant. I mean, the 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 Navy bases in Southern California, those things are huge. Why would Southern Indiana be able to compete for this federal program with those other the, those other places? Well, we've got six that I mean, as the slide will tell you, we've got a bunch of state parks, a bunch of state forests, fish and wildlife areas state nature preserves. We've got three national wildlife refuges. We've got the Hoosier National Forest. I mean, I, we, we started looking at it and we said, boy, we I think we have a pretty good recipe. And so we looked at the map and let the map do the talking. And we could spend all day, those of us, I mean, I, I, I feel like if you're a conservationist, you're a map lover almost by definition. Uh, we put together, we looked at the map and let the map tell the story for us. So what we Originally proposed was 6.5 million acres, which was almost all of Southern Indiana. Uh, they told us we had the, I, honestly, they told us we had the best application. Uh, we got feedback. They said we had the best application, but at 6.5 million acres, they were gonna kick us out because it was too big. Uh, so they told us to pare it down. So instead of using county boundaries, we used, some of you will know the term Huck 12 watershed boundaries. So sub watersheds, we looked at sub watersheds, not the giant watersheds, but kind of a medium sized, watershed in Indiana and use those as the boundaries. We came up with this boundary that's the dark purple. Uh, it doesn't go all the way to the Ohio border, but almost goes all the way to the Ohio border. Hopefully you can, can you see my cursor? Let's say, yeah, okay, you can see my cursor. So over here is Air National Guard. And this big gray thing is the old Jefferson Proving Grounds, which was military. Now it's Big Oaks National Wildlife Refuge. Y'all remember when we had a a uh, black bear living in Indiana for three years. He just went back to Kentucky last year, but we had a black bear living in Indiana, a wild black bear living in Indiana for three years. And somehow nobody shot it, which is great uh, and amazing to me, to be honest. But it lived, I mean, that's a big enough piece of ground that it it could it could host a bear without getting shot by, by, by a farmer, basically, uh, which is fantastic. If you've ever flown over Jefferson Proving Grounds, it almost looks like... Uh, a runway of trees. I mean, it's in the middle of an agricultural part of Indiana and it's just a huge natural natural habitat block. So we've got Air National Guard over here. There's another very small uh, military installation here, but this is Army. This is Camp Atterbury. Uh, Camp Atterbury is pretty big in its own right. That's 30,000 30, something acres, 35,000 acres or so at Camp Atterbury. Crane, as I said, is the third largest naval base in the world by geography or by acreage, and that's 64,000 acres or so. It's the largest intact habitat in the entire state uh, of a single block. And then we've got a very small naval facility over here called Lake Lendora Test Facility, where they use old, some of you know the term stripper pits, old deep stripper pits, coal mining pits, the, the, the high wall pits sometimes called. And they use those for sonar testing and things like that because they're hundreds of feet deep. Uh, and so they do testing, they do some testing over there. And so we said, okay, for starters, we've got four military bases. That's a that's a good place to start for what is essentially a, a military program or primarily a military program. But let's look at it from a conservation lens and not strictly a military lens. We've got huge intact forest blocks. I mean, if you've ever watched the Doppler radar, you can see how Southern Indiana shows up on Doppler radar. I mean, the Brown County Hills block of the central hardwood region. I mean, we've got the largest block of hardwood trees until you get to the Appalachian Mountains uh, is in Southern Indiana. And that's a, a pretty incredible thing given the agricultural, the largely agricultural nature of the state. But we, between the state forests and the national forests, we've got huge intact forest blocks. It's not a hundred percent contiguous. I mean, if you really drill down on it, of course, it's a checkerboard pattern. The Hoosier is is a checkerboard pattern, but it's a huge forest block system uh, between the state and and national forest. We've got the national wildlife refuges, which of course are amazing. Big Oaks is right here. Muscatatuck is right here, and then down here, uh, near and dear to Bill McCoy's heart, who's on the call here today, is Patoka River National Wildlife Refuge 
we weren't able to pick up all of that, but we picked up the tail of it uh, because we knew that was important. Uh, so we've got three National Wildlife refuge, Refuges. But the most important thing, and I think the, the most telling part of the entire map, and, and to be honest, in my opinion, probably the most telling part of our entire application was the fact that look at the river corridors that we have in this part of the state. It's it's just an amazing way to tie together those other resources. If we're talking about for if we're talking about the bases and the forest blocks, the river corridors in, in this area, they tie them together naturally. So let me back this out a second and tell you a personal story that this is not at all about me. I'm I'm a I stand on the shoulders of giants in this thing, but um I think it gives a little context to it tells a story that I think is important for the Indiana side of things. My first environmental job was in northern Wyoming, working for the Powder River Basin Resource Council in 1994. I was a grassroots organizer for environmental stuff in 1994. That was about a year after, that was that part's not important at all. It was about a year after they started, the smart guys out there started the Yellowstone to Yukon project. Some of you are probably familiar with that. That was really the first, I mean, maybe not technically the first, but really kind of the first what we call landscape scale conservation project in the United States. There may have been other smaller ones, but that thing hit the headlines. And those of us who, who are conservationists, or, or at the time I was a budding conservationist, that just blew our minds. The idea was to try to like think about the animals like a single grizzly bear will use 500 square miles of habitat. Uh, of territory and other migratory birds. And think about how we have different kinds of protected federal land. We've got national forests, national parks, national monuments, DOD stuff. We've got BLM. We've got all different kinds of federal, and they have, all of them have different sorts of protections. You could argue whether or not BLM land is protected. I get, I get that we could get bogged down in the nuances of that. But think about the kinds of federal lands that are out there that are protected habitat in one form or another. And then there's the whole state side of things. And the idea, and then there's the whole can Canadian version of that. The idea was to try to tie together using a combination of ownership and conservation easements and other legal tools to try to tie together connected habitat all the way from Yellowstone National Park in Northwestern Wyoming to the Yukon Territory in Northern Canada. And it's ongoing. It is a very successful thing. It is. It has raised many, many millions of dollars and saved I don't know, probably millions of, of acres over the course of time. And I was there right at the beginning of that thing. I come home and I want to be an environmental lawyer and a conservationist. And I, I'm thinking the whole time, how do we get this started in Indiana? How do we do landscape scale conservation in Indiana? We just, you, you can't, in Montana, you can do 10,000 acres at a time. In Indiana, you have to do 100 acres at a time. And how are you going to translate that into a Midwest, how do you how do you translate landscape scale thinking into a Midwestern landscape? Because of the fragmentation, it can't be done in the same way. And so we, over the course of time, dozens of us have been thinking about how to do this. And this Sentinel landscape may provide that opportunity. Never in a million years would I have thought the Department of Defense would be the vehicle that we might go about trying to make that happen. But hey, it, it is turning out to be a, the vehicle that we're gonna try to make that happen. The idea being, okay, we're never going to be able to save 3.5 million acres. That's not realistic. It's there's too many. There's a million parcels in there. I mean, and it would just be too expensive. And there's too many people. It's just there's no way that's ever going to happen. So the idea, what if what if instead of thinking about trying to do huge blocks of own, owned habitat, what if we could protect nodes, like take the bases as nodes and take the national wildlife refuges as nodes? take the Hoosier and the state forests as nodes, and then use the river corridors as the sinews, which would connect them. And Vicki's completely right, of course, that ju just because it's a corridor doesn't mean it's habitat. But if you're gonna look for corridors that are habitat, river corridors are the, where you're gonna find them, most likely. I mean, wetlands are the proxy for good when it comes to habitat. Everything, almost everything likes wetlands and river corridors. So. You know, and because we're not going to be able to do huge, I mean, we're not going to save these 3.5 million acres, but we might be able to focus on the floodplains and the river corridors um, and provide connectivity that way. And there's lots of legal tools that can do that. I mean, we're lawyers by trade. We we know how to work with conservation easements. And um, so that, that would be that that would be the, the idea of how to go about doing that. 
Um, it would be the way that we can translate landscape scale conservation to the Midwest. And I'll tell you what, if, I, I feel like if we can pull it off in Southern Indiana, we can show how it's done. I mean, it could be a model for how conservation is done in the fragmented landscape. Um, I think that ultimately, not only could we protect this awesome place, which is our home, but if if we can pull it off, we can change the way conservation is done, at least in the eastern United States. We can change the way conservation is is envisioned. And, and that's a pretty powerful thing to think about. So uh, the goals, uh, as I said, there's multiple goals in the Sentinel Landscape Program. The first and foremost one is mission readiness, which is to deal with encroachments. Encroachments take different forms, as I said. The most obvious one, uh, and encroachments is the term that the military uses. Uh, the most obvious one is neighbors that are complaining. Um, actually, here's a better slide to talk about that. No, that's not. This one's better. All right. Na uh, neighbors will complain about things, but then there's there's other there's other encroachment issues that you have to deal with. Many people don't know what they do at Crane. What they used to do is build big bullets that you fire out of shifts. But these days, what they do is one of the main things that they do at Crane is uh, do interference. They create, they develop technology that jams other, that jams the bad guys' drones. You want to jam, you know, they, if you can interfere with the way that you, that the bad guys communicate with their drones, the drones are useless. And that's a whole technology. Well, if they're doing that, they're, if they have to do testing on interference, they're going to create problems for communities that are anywhere near them within a five mile buffer. There's what they call a spectrum buffer, where they want to make sure that they're not completely wrecking the livelihoods of the communities around them for in, in, within five miles. So at Crane, they have what they call spectrum interference problems or electronics issues. Um, there's water quality issues. These bases typically treat, they, they gather and treat their own water. If you've got residential development upstream or ag runoff upstream and it's coming onto the base, that creates a problem for them keeping their troops ready. At, at Atterbury, Atterbury used to be out in the middle of nowhere in Johnson County, you know, and now it's Johnson County is a bedroom county. It's a, it's one of the collar counties for Indianapolis, and residential development has creeped that creeped up to the borders of uh, up to the, uh, the borders of Atterbury over time. So. They've got to deal with runoff from ag. They've got to deal with runoff from subdivisions. Uh, and that becomes a water quality issue and a, and a mission readiness problem for them. Um, and so, I mean, I could, there really literally are dozens of interference issues that the bases have to deal with. And so our primary goal on this thing, first and foremost, we have to be faithful to protecting the military bases. And it, the very shorthand version of that is buffering the bases. The more natural land that we can create around the borders of the bases, the better. But while we're doing that, the program was built specifically, as I said earlier, to try to support ag and working land. And in southern Indiana, the, that, that working land is working for us primarily. Um, they want to protect riparian corridors. Water quality is a big one. Uh, there's forest land protection. And then, of course, every federal agency is obliged to follow the Endangered Species Act. And in Indiana, we don't have a ton of uh, federally endangered species, but we do have the Indiana bat, and we are smack dab in the middle of the epicenter for the Indiana bat. Uh, the Indiana bats are only federally endangered species at the moment. We're likely to add a few more bats, unfortunately, in the next couple of years. But um, right now, the Endangered Species Act uh, in southern Indiana, is, when you're talking about endang federally endangered species, you're primarily talking about bats, uh, either Indiana bats or long northern long-eared bats, um, which I think right now is a uh, threatened species. So we have, the program was built to do these multiple things. And um, what we have in Southern Indiana is the ability to pull that off in multiple ways. How are we going to do that? Let's go back to our map. How are we going to do that? Chris, we just wanted to let you know we're a few minutes to one. It's okay if we go a little bit over, we just wanted you to be. Oh, I'll, I'll wrap up. I'm not that, I'm, okay. I'm really not that interesting. <laughs> I want people to know about the program. Absolutely. And this, I can wrap up with this primarily. How are we going to do it? It's going to happen, in, in my opinion, it's going to happen primarily in three ways. We're going to we're going to get some land owned. We're going to buy some land or have some land donated to us. And I don't when I say us, I don't mean Conservation Law Center. That's not realistic. It might go to the, you might want to add on to adding on to Crane is probably not likely. But theoretically, we could add on to a state park. We could add on to Goose Pond Fish and Wildlife Area, which is a state property. We could add on to 
theoretically a national wildlife area or the Hoosier National Forest. There's going to be some public land that, that is added onto, I expect. That's going to be a fairly small percentage. Um, and there's going to be some land donated to land trusts, like Sycamore Land Trust in Southern Indiana or George Rogers Clark or Oak Heritage in Southern Indiana. It's going to be some land that's owned publicly and privately. A bigger category than that is going to be conservation easements. Conservation easements can either be private or public. The public one is going to be much bigger. Think about the Farm Bill programs. The Farm Bill programs are, I mean, there's a dozen Farm Bill programs to protect wetlands, to protect highly erodible soils. Uh, there's dozens of Farm Bill programs. And those, a farmer raises his hand, says, I've got 100 acres of wetlands. And he enrolls in the program. Uh, if he qualifies for it, he can get uh, he can get paid to stop farming those wetlands, and that's a permanent protection on that land forever. I think there's going to be a lot of land that gets enrolled in federal conservation easement programming, and then I think the biggest category of all, honestly, and people might quibble about whether this is actually protected land, but the biggest category of all, I think, is going to be land that may not may or may not be permanently protected. But we if we can improve the way private landowners manage their property in terms of best best management practices by doing buffer strips along their riparian corridors, by putting in erosion controls like water bars on their steep hillsides, by doing invasive control, by doing tree plantings, and, and uh, honestly, things like cover crops, simple things that are becoming more and more common like cover crops. If we can improve the way that people protect, uh, manage their land, uh, even if it's not permanently protected, that'll have significant benefits for the quality, for water quality, for endangered species habitat, and overall connectivity on the landscape scale. So, uh, because we're at the end of time, I will try to shut up uh, unless I have anything else that's super important. I do not. You can reach me that way if you want to. Uh, but uh, other than that, I'm happy to answer any questions and I'm sorry for going on so long. That's terrific. Thank you again, Dr. Freitag and Dr. Moretsky. Uh, I'm going to launch a, a poll here for folks who have just about 30 seconds they could uh, spend on answering that. That's helpful for us to gauge interest and feedback for future topics. Uh, if you wanted to unshare your screen, Dr. Freitag, we could uh, stay on for maybe an extra 10 minutes for anyone ha who happens to have the time and does have a few questions uh, sensitive to the fact it's one o'clock. We've gone for an hour here. Of course, no worries if you want to step off. Um, so thanks again for taking a few moments to fill out, fill out that feedback poll. And we'll uh, open it up to questions. Feel free to, to put something in the chat. I see one actually from Brian Will here. It says for Dr. Moretsky, does she know what type of investment in the state uh, make that the state is making in wildlife bridges over highways to help animals safely cross and connect habitat? I have not seen anything. Wildlife bridges tend to start at about a million dollars a pop, and I'm not familiar with any. Uh, but I'm also not familiar with any places where anyone has suggested that we're in dire need of having them. Uh, I do know some places where there are some, um, some plots about doing culvert underpass sorts of things, but I think those tend to be much more local and they're smaller projects, so it's much easier to get a, you know, a local part of the Department of Transportation or what have you to be responsive there. They certainly are coming on internationally and there's some big ones that have been used very successfully in the West. If you do a Google on uh, wildlife overpass and camera, you can see some really fascinating work being done and some species that you, you know, porcupines using wildlife overpasses over you know, great big multi-million highways. So, they're coming on, but within the state, I'm not aware of any. We do have some DNR folks in um, in the meeting, I, and I would invite anyone who knows more from the state level to unmute for a moment and give us an answer. Yeah, I think folks should be able to unmute just generally and can weigh in or ask questions if they'd like. We no direct feedback on, on that point at this moment. Uh, other questions from folks? Just, uh, do you have any idea where funds will come from for acquisitions? <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked, Bill. I didn't do a good job explaining um, 
I, I threw out the big number of five hundred million dollars, and I didn't actually say where it's coming from or where, you know how it's going to be directed. I would like to tell you that a hundred million dollars would come to Conservation Law Center, and that would be amazing, but uh, not true. Almost all that money is going to go to private landowners. Uh, it's not new money. There's no new money that is attached to Sentinel. It's not, it's not a, a, a new pot of money. So I, I don't have to explain to you because you know what the existing pots of money are. What this program does is prioritize all of the competitive cons federal conservation programs that are out there already, like WRP, CRP, all these ones that we all have worked with for years. And those are competitive programs. You have to fill out an application and you, you get ranked. You have a scoring, it's a scoring system, right? And you're going up against Ohio and Kentucky and Illinois now you have extra points on your application because you're part of the sentinel lands if if you're within that 3.5 million acre boundary now you get prioritized on all the existing federal programs so the pot of money the, the pots of money are all of the existing pots of money that you're already familiar with it's not new pots of money and it doesn't come to us it goes to those private landowners to enable them to enroll in wrp crp and all those other programs Can you speak at all, uh, Christian, to um, the strategies you'll use to work with folks, landowners, uh, organizations in, in counties within this uh, landscape to highlight those opportunities and maybe try to help coordinate, you know, the effort of, of making use of those available funds? Yes. The out, I mean, I, I'm, if I understand your qu question correctly, Matt, um, I'll, I'll, I'll answer it and then I I'm going to answer the question that I heard in my head, and hopefully that's the one that you asked. Uh, you know how that goes. Uh, we're going to have to do a really good job of outreach to multiple communities, and I mean broad communities. We're going to have to reach people in the ag community. How are we going to do that? We're going to have to show up at the Farm Bureau Bean Supper in Jackson County and make sure that those people know about this opportunity, because it's an opportunity for private landowners. I mean, it's not an opportunity for academics. This is not, not I mean, there might be ancillary opportunities for academics and, and public agencies, but the opportunities here, the primary ones are for private landowners. Uh, and so we have to do a good job of reaching the people where they are. And that means doing a roadshow. And we're hiring, we're hiring two people. One's a lawyer and one's a project coordinator who's a forester uh, to oversee the Sentinel program for us. And we're gonna have to reach the ag community, but that's, and working for us, like working, working for us and working farms too. But I don't think those are the only communities that we want to try to plug into. We have a lot of the state in particular has started a number of programs with the help of Eli Lilly and other funding uh, organizations like in, in southern Indiana along the I-69 highway corridor. You've got the Regional Opportunities Initiative, which is essentially trying to do economic development and job development opportunities along the highway corridor. Uh, in, a, in a fairly depressed part of the state when it comes to economic and job opportunities. So I think when you're talking about quality of life and creating job opportunities, the good jobs go where the people want to live. And uh, things like water quality. And I mean, yeah, you, your average person probably doesn't care a heck of a lot about Indiana bats, but your average person cares a heck of a lot about access to nature for his family, his or her family, and access to good water quality uh, to raise that family. So we're going to have to not only reach the the people who own the land and work the land like the farmers and the foresters, but I think we're going to have to really think more broadly about all of the constituent groups that can be useful to help us spread the word and, and leverage each other. If Lily wants to spend $75 million on the Regional Opportunities Initiative, we ought to figure out a way that that $75 works well and, and is simpatico with the money that's going to be flowing to Indiana for the conservation purposes too. Thank you. Any other questions from folks who were able to stay on? I noticed a, a few synergies in, in uh, maybe it was in Dr. Maretsky's presentation. Um, with a, a recent session we'd hosted uh, for our Hoosier Resilience Index Community of Practice series, we, we just wrapped up uh, with some food and agriculture focus. And um, Dr. Landon Yoder from uh, the O'Neill School had joined us and was talking about two-stage ditches and wider um, 
corridors along uh, sort of the, the the water infrastructure that helps you know drain fields ag, ag land, and and was yeah pointing out all these different uh, rural green infrastructure options uh, to help you know manage flooding, manage water flow, and 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 that sort of thing. And it seemed like there were some opportunities with those types of uh, interventions, which again you know county governments, uh, local governments might play a role in in facilitating. Uh, and building those social networks to advance some of those solutions. It seems like there was a role for that type of infrastructure in, in the uh, habitat connectivity space uh, as well. Did, was I reading that right when you, when you all were mentioning that? Wider buffers along or long roadways, that sort of thing. Is that a question for me? Either one. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I think there's, uh, there's low hanging fruit uh, in a number of different areas, but certainly those, yes. Um, the, the question, you know, going from 10 feet to 30 feet on buffers does, does not buy us what going from uh, 10 feet to a tenth of a mile would buy us. But 10 feet isn't terribly worth anything, whereas 30 feet is uh, in terms of water quality, even in terms of, you know, habitat for small things like frogs. Um, so there are gains at almost any increase, and depending on what you're talking about, you can graph out, you know, where are the big jumps? Yeah, I mean, even to add to that, Vicki, I mean, I would say not just think about roads, but think about river corridors. If we can get people to do buffer strips along riparian corridors, yeah, I'd love 200 feet. I'd take 20 feet because the benefits of that would, would extend not just to habitat, uh, allow animals to migrate along corridors. It would be water quality. Uh, we're the biggest, Indiana is the biggest contributor to the dead zone, the Gulf hypoxia problem. You know, it would do a lot to solve a lot of things, even if you could just get 20 feet. Likewise, you know, one of the things that has really hurt things like monarch butterflies and uh, bobwhite quail and other things that fence rows, if you could get three feet on each side of a fence row, you're, that's a heck of a lot of habitat. Or if you aggregate it, if you're thinking about how much habitat can be, now, nowadays it's actually, you, you don't find that many fence rows that give a tiny little bit of buffer. And you could, you could, you could achieve a fair, a fair gain if you could uh, just add a little bit on each side of those things. Pollinator habitat and also um, predator habitat for, for ag insects. The problem with, is with all the ag stuff that the economies of scale issues and the drift issues that the pesticides and the fertilizers and all, all the sides uh, don't stay quite where you put them, they do drift. And so for a, a narrow fence row, trying to make sure that you're not killing, I, I talked about trap habitat, sink habitat. You don't want to create habitat for pollinators and then drift insecticide over it several times a year. That would be a trap. Yeah, great points. Thanks so much. We should probably- uh, oh, I have yeah, one more question. question. Will, will there be a ranking system developed perhaps by uh, CLC to focus on best opportunities or priority areas? And then will DOD have some input based on their needs? Yeah, I, we will develop a ranking system. I'm sure we will, Bill. I mean, our, fir our first six months of this thing is make a plan so we can work a plan. Uh, we already have a draft implementation plan, but it does not include yet a ranking system. I expect that we will develop a ranking system and CLC won't develop it alone and then get input. It'll be developed as a group effort with the DOD folks, the Nature Conservancy, I mean, we'll try to make it as, as broad as possible. We have something like 26 partners already identified on this thing, but the core working group is Conservation Law Center, the Nature Conservancy, and folks from DOD. Uh, and, and we have others that are heavily involved, folks from Hoosier National Forest, Chris Thornton, Mike Chavez was on this call earlier, I noticed. Um, so we're gonna, we will develop a ranking system and we'll try to get input from all the big players. Thank you again so much. I think we can go ahead and wrap up uh, the webinar. Uh, this is really informative. Great to learn about those opportunities, about those general strategies. I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more about the Sentinel landscape in particular in the coming years. I'm uh, looking forward to those discussions. Uh, thanks for the folks who were able to stick around a little bit longer to, to engage in the discussion too. So we had a, a content rich uh, 
final webinar of our of our 2021-2022 series. Thanks again for joining and uh, please remember to help look out for a, a survey to, to guide next year's uh, series as well in the coming months. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks folks.